Yeah. There was a lot of dancing. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this opening night behind the scenes conversation with the playwright Madhuri Shaker and our own artistic director, Jason Lowe. Uh, if you were expecting Karen, she sends her apologies. She's in a rehearsal uh, workshopping in New York, and she really wanted to be here. But um, thank you all for joining us. We're really excited to open the play tonight and, um, you know, give you a glimpse of what went in, uh, what was like in Madhuri's mind when she wrote the play and how her process is and how she also leans into her cultural upbringing and dissertation when she writes these plays and, uh, you know, these stories. So I welcome Madhuri and Jason. <laughs> Welcome. All right, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Shruti, for setting this up. Uh, I'm sorry that Karen Zacharias isn't with us. I'm sure many of you have seen Karen's plays. How many of you have seen like Native Gardens at Arena most recently, some others? Yeah, so Gary, uh, uh, she's a fantastic playwright. So you get me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but I'm really happy to be here. I think you all know uh, behind the scenes events are designed to contextualize the show that we were about to open for members of our community. We're really glad that you joined us for this. <laughs> um, these are free. So we are uh, freedom members, so we're really happy that you are here. Tonight is opening night of a nice Indian boy. How many of you have seen the show? It has had a couple of previews. Anybody? Oh, wonderful. Great. So you, I'm just going to keep asking you for questions. <laughs> Uh, we will have uh, time for question and answer uh, towards the end. This will be about 45, 50 minutes. Um, uh, so, oh, Audrey, thank you and welcome. Thank you. I'm going to brag on you. Do you mind if I brag on you? I have Nobody knows because he's just at 45 to 50 minutes. He's like, what are you going to talk about? <laughs> oh, I got it all. No. Um, and you know what? We can always leave early and just Yeah. Um, so, uh, Madhuri's a playwright whose work has been hailed across the country um, for its deep and powerful drawing of relationships, especially those between women. Its combination of heart and intellect. I actually came up with some of this myself, yeah, but I. Those who don't know the It's incredible variety of style and form. Uh, uh, the way you can define a Madhuri Shekhar play is not by comparing it to other plays that she's written. Uh, and crucially, the way her plays claim the American stage for South Asian stories, which have been severely underrepresented. Her stage, stage credits are Legion, her film and television credits as part of Legion. Um, and you can read about them in the program. I'm not going to go through all of them, except that, except that on Amazon, on Hulu, on HBO, you will see her name all over that. Um, so I'd rather share this. This is from that American theater. Uh, American theater is a magazine that the uh, American theater published a fantastic interview profile uh, last year, so I have to read this. In the Bay Area, where she was born, her dad worked as a software engineer, but he also spent his free time with the local Tomo community group, uh, theater group. They would do these Tomo plays for the Tomo community, and they would all rehearse at our house. Uh, when Shekhar was six, her dad took a job in Singapore, so the family moved, but classism and colorism in that South Asian Republic rubbed Shekhar the wrong way. She said, Singapore had this program, for example, in their public schools where you were not the appropriate height and weight. You had to take exercise classes during lunch. So that was humiliating and awful. So when she was nine, when she was nine, right, everybody think about what you were doing when you were nine. <laughs> when she was nine, at the end of their annual, annual family vacation to Shanghai in India, Shekhar told her family that she wanted to stay behind that she hated Singapore and wanted to live in India full-time. Her parents went back to Singapore, leaving her with extended family in India, convinced that Shekhar would change her mind. She didn't, and after five months, her parents relented and moved the entire family mm. to India. <laughs> <laughs> the only person who I know, the only other theater maker I know who is that self-actualized is Julie Tamar. Who like, no, seriously, she was like at the age of 11, she's like, I'm going to Indonesia and learn about puppets. And her parents were like, cool. Her parents were cool, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about, though, how that's foundational for you. So 
to, uh, can you connect that story to the kind of work that you do? I know that's a hard question. And I, and I told Marguerite that I was not going to ask her hard questions because she she's traveling for the first time with her two kids, one of whom is an infant, and she's a little tired. I said I wouldn't be this rough on you. Oh, no, that's a great question. And I've never thought of it that way. I've always thought of that moment as like, that's the story I tell people, like, especially like, you know, college application messages or like, tell us something about me that defines who you are. And it's like, well, at nine, I forced my family to move countries. Um, <laughs> but, uh, oh God, this, I don't know, this feels like a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, when you're a child, it's like you, you do things, but then the adults tell you things, and then that becomes narrative in your head. So, like, the narrative in my, the narrative that, that adults would like back to me was like, oh, you know what you want. You know what you want, and you're stubborn. <laughs> um, and, I, and I guess then I was like, okay, cool. So, I'm a person who knows what I want, and I am stubborn. Both of which are very useful if you want to have a career in the arts. Um, you have to be stubborn because it's really hard to um, stay resilient. It's hard to keep doing this. You have to be like stubbornly convinced of your own worth. Um, and you need to know what you want like in life, in the story you're writing. You need to know what it is, why you're doing it, what you want, and just kind of go there with a weird single-minded effort. So yeah, that's a great question. I never, yeah, I think that's, I think that's it. Um, so, I, I don't know, it's just uh, be mindful of what you tell kids because they will <laughs> take it very seriously and then shape their whole life around it. <laughs> and I do think that, I mean, I, I, I started my career as a dramaturg, so I'm always sort of looking for the breadcrumbs that I can either relate to previous plays that the person has read or other plays that have been written or whatever. So, so that, that question comes from. But I certainly look at a nice idea the way, and I see, I, I do see some of those qualities. Um, in some of the characters, so let's start talking about that. Let's talk about the play. Um, but before we actually talk in specific about the play, can we talk a little bit about EDLJ? Oh, yes. Excellent. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, watching, I have to say, watching previews here is so awesome to watch. I was just talking to you this, well, awesome to watch. Um, there's people in the audience who clearly have seen EDLJ a million times, and there's clearly people in the audience who have no idea of what that even is. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know, by the way, uh, DDLJ is a movie that was made um, in India in 1995 on a budget of $4 million and has now grossed $2 billion worldwide. Um, sort of totemic for many, not just in the South Asian community, but certainly a lot of, um, a lot of folks in India and from in, in the India expat community around the world. How would you describe, could you describe for us what DDLJ is for those of us in the audience who may not know? Yeah, DDLJ, a very, a very simple story summary is um, these two uh, South Asian uh, young people who are born and raised in London meet on a train ride through New York and fall in love. The, the catch is that the girl um, is engaged to somebody she's never met back in India because her dad is super conservative, like scary conservative. So she's like, we could never be, I could go to India and get married, and he's like, and I'll, I'll, you know, we'll see about that. So she goes to India and like is in the process of getting engaged to this like not great guy. And then Shah Rukh Khan, the, the lover, the boyfriend, the hero, shows up, pretends he's a family friend and like crashes the whole wedding party. And his plan is to get her parents to fall in love with him so that when they reveal that they want to be together, the parents will be like, cool. <laughs> And it's and it's it's so bonkers. <laughs> so, and Kajal, the the, her, the heroine, at, at a few points is like, can we just a little <laughs> like this is? And then he, being the good Indian boy, right, is like, no, we cannot be together unless your parents approve, and we're gonna win their approval. And uh, things literally get bloody near the end, and then there's a triumphant train ride, and uh, everyone lives happily ever after. And it's just. It's like it's this. It's this. It's this absolute like. I don't know. It just feels like it represents like that that cultural shift in India when like falling in love was no longer maybe as taboo as it used to be, 
but your parents still had to get, you know, your parents still had to get their blessing for it. So um, it's just a, it's a great, it's a great movie. It's very compelling. It's, it's very strange and it's, uh, the songs are incredible and uh, the performances, like the, perform the, act the two lead actors are just, you know, top of the game, brilliant. So uh, if you haven't seen the movie, it, enjoy it, it's three hours. <laughs> Enjoy the other two billion people who have seen it, or uh, 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 and so you can be as culturally literate as they are. Um, so you peppered uh, you peppered a nice Indian boy throughout with specifically with songs from DDLJ, um, and, and obviously there are a lot of thematic connections. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, what can I say that it is not? Uh, well, it's in our marketing material, so I can certainly say a nice Indian boy is. Or, or do you want to describe your play? I can describe your play. I'll describe it. Um, uh, uh, a nice Indian boy is uh, uh, is the story of Naveen, um, a second generation <clears throat> Indian American, South Asian American, uh, who is gay, living with his uh, uh, living in the Bay Area, is, and he wants to bring home his for the first time a boyfriend to meet his parents. What's weird is the boyfriend that he's brought is bringing home as a young Hindu named Keshav, who happens to be white. Uh, and great, awesome things ensue, and that's all I'm going to say. Um, but of course, the play then traverses in a lot of the same conversations about tradition versus progressivism, uh, uh, what is love. You talk a lot in the play, not you. The characters talk a lot in the play about there's no love in this house, um, when of course there is of a different kind. So, so. And I know you wrote it a long time ago at this point, almost nine years, but can you talk about the origins of the play for you and what made you want to tell that story? Did you want the, did DGL, did the idea of using the music of DGLJ come into it later or were you thinking about it at the time? Whatever you can share. Yeah, um, I wrote the play for uh, one of my classes in my MFA program and um, the professor, Professor challenged us to write something very personal, and um, my parents were trying to set me up with nice and big boys at the time, and it was very difficult. I did not want to do it, but I also didn't know how to get them to knock it off because I didn't have a really good argument. I didn't. I, I couldn't. I couldn't explain to them why it made me feel so terrible because they were saying, "But don't you want to get married?" And I was like, "Yeah, I guess I do want that. I do want that little number thing. I do want it, but it's." But and then and then, the, and then the argument would break and then we would fight and so it was just really painful for me and it's also like 23 I just felt like what is happening I, I, so um, so all of that turmoil was going on inside me and um, I I wanted to write about that but I didn't want to write like the boring and arranged marriage stories that I thought were all really way too common and it wasn't interesting and um, I don't really know where the view came from it just came. Me and Keisha was um, a person based on the person I knew, That's and <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the loveliest, the loveliest man um, who is uh, still a, 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 a kind of a cultural diplomat who travels the world and speaks all these languages. And he came up to me and spoke to me in Hindi one day, and I was like, I am so sorry, I don't speak Hindi. Mm -hmm. And we just had a, a really nice conversation. Like, this guy's cool, and I want to put him in a play, and I want him to be like a romantic lead. Um, so that's that's kind of how that, that happened. And um, and so it was kind of like, well, what about what if there's this guy who actually really wants what I don't want? What if he really really wants a traditional Indian marriage? For but he's gay, right? So how's that going to go? And then what if his sister had the traditional Indian marriage and it's not working out? It was kind of like me being like, okay, what's going to happen if I say yes to one of these guys, right? In 10 years from now, I'm going to be divorced. It's not going to work out. Um, and then, so I had those two characters and then it was like, well, how are my parents going to react to these two characters? And then I just put my parents in the play. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it kind of was just like, you know, it was a very emotional time. I had these questions. I was like, let's, let's see what happens, kind of a, a way to write the play. And DDLJ, what happened, you know, I was just thinking about the characters, and I, as a very, like, young playwright, I, I was like, what, well, what's a structure? What's a thing I can hang this on? And I thought about DDLJ, which is just like that really weird 
thing about like, okay, falling in love is fine and good, but unless your parents really approve of it, it's not real. And that was a, a concept that is very problematic and at the same time very like compelling to me. It would be, I, you know, I'm, I'm married, have kids with someone who is not Indian, and if my parents had actually disapproved, I, I think I would still be completely devastated. Like it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, so yeah, just all of these things floating around with the either and they all kind of, kind of get together. Oh, and one more thing, one more thing, the style of the show very much inspired by the Tamil plays that my dad was putting on his friends in the theater. So there's a, a very popular, um, there's a very famous playwright, <clears throat> screenwriter, who sadly passed away a few years ago. He was Crazy Mohan. And he wrote all of these incredible broad farces and family comedies, and they were just ridiculous and silly and over the top, and it would always be like a living room set, and the family would be there, and like, Characters would come in like Kramer, <laughs> just be like, um, it would just be really fun and silly. And I remember those stories growing up. So I thought, let's write this, let's write something contemporary about that format. So, yeah. I love actually that you bring that uh, that, that, that you bring that up. I didn't realize that because um, one of the things that I so love about this play is how it sort of um, is is this the right word culturally polyglot in that it you know it. It brings to mind those Tamil plays that we're talking about that are farces, but there's something that sort of almost uh, uh, early 20th century American dramas that I grew up knowing about, um, and family family comedies and so on, and of course DBLJ so sort of spans like you do many different cultures and ideas and a great assimilation of story. Um, so Archie and Mega are your parents. Yes. Awesome. I. I I love your parents, and I don't know who they are because <laughs> I've only seen them across the way at least in the show. Um, did they surprise? Well, this is sort of a question about how you write, and it may be, and feel free to tell me, like, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't know how I write. Um, but did the did it surprise? Did they surprise you? How they? Oh, the spoiler alert! They come around. <laughs> um, did it surprise you the way they came around at the end of the play? Do your characters ever surprise you that way, or are you like, I know what they're going to do, and I know where they're going to go? I, it seemed inevitable to me that they would come around. I just knew that it would be a very hard fought battle. So that I knew, and I, I, I think, yeah, I think like the, the, the moments where the parents actually become real and vulnerable with their children were surprising to me. That has never happened with me. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe. It's, it's happened like in a different way. Um, the sister's journey was the one that was had the most rewrites. Like, I really didn't know where she was going because she was a projection of me, and it was almost me being like, well, what kind of future do I want to write for myself? And I just kept Mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> uh, that's, that's yeah, that's really interesting. Arun Dati, this character who shows up quite unexpectedly at the start of the play, and you will see tonight or whenever you come see the show, you will see what happens uh, to her. But you very interestingly, we you know, I, I know what's going to happen to Naveen and Keshav after the play. I know what's going to happen to Archie Kumega after the play. Nobody knows what's going to happen to Arun Dati after the play, really. Yeah, that was the that was the ending that kind of made sense. Yeah, which is like we don't know. That's right. So is it true, um, by the way, you you have the best agent in all the country. I, like, in my 30 years in this business, I've met a lot of agents, and some of them are really awful. Um, but, and it's not, I don't think that Beth is watching this at home, but Beth, if you she's are, too she's too busy. Beth Flicker is just her agent, but anyway, Beth told me um, uh, about the film that is happening with my Cindy boy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is it has it already been shot? Is it going to be shot? Is it a... Everyone just keep your fingers crossed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. So here's the thing. I can tell you this because it's no longer. This guy's no longer happening. But we almost had Jonathan Groff in the movie. <gasps> and like, no, I know. And it's scheduling conflict two weeks before the production is going to start. This is a very common story, how right? Especially independent film. Right? Getting an independent film made is. It's going to be a miracle if it does happen. But 
uh, there's a beautiful screenplay that I did not write. I didn't want to write the screenplay. It's written by um, a screenwriter called Eric Redmill. Um, and he I'm going to ask, of course, why you didn't want to write that in a moment. Yeah, I, it wasn't, yeah. I'm, I'm one of the producers on the movie, but I didn't want to write the screenplay. Eric wrote a just beautiful, beautiful screenplay. Uh, the director attached um, is uh, someone called Ro Roshan Sethi, who is also an incredible human being. Um, and uh, he, <laughs> so he's a queer Indian man who is both a screenwriter, director, producer type, and also a doctor, like an actual doctor. <laughs> like he works in palliative cancer care. Like, so how Indian can you be, right? <laughs> Um, Roshan's boyfriend is Kevin Sony, who you might recognize as he's been in so many things. He was in Deadpool, I guess that's the thing people recommend him from. So Kevin is going to play in mean, if and when the movie gets made. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, just everything's ready, everything's ready to go. The producers are the people who made Hidden Figures and they made, um, that good each other. Oh, did Vicky Thomas cast that? Same, same cast as Um, yeah, so, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully it'll get made. I think it's, uh, I think the time is good, and people would love to see just a happy rom-com. <laughs> if, if, if the preview audiences here are any indication, they are very ready for it. Um, okay, so you have to talk, oh, there's some more for you. Um, so why do you want to write the screenplay? This, asking somebody who is completely ignorant of the workings of Hollywood, and you obviously have done a lot of work there. I could have written the screenplay if I wanted to. I didn't want to because I wanted um, a, a, a queer screenwriter to write it. And so Eric wrote it, and he imbued Naveen and Keisha's relationship with so much heart and specificity and love, and he expanded their circle of friends, and now all of them are vibrant characters. And I just had this like real lived in feel that I never could have given them. You know, my interest was the family, my interest were the parents, my interest was brother sister dynamic. Like, I love Naveen and Keisha, but that wasn't really the focus of the, of the play. Um, and I wanted the movie to honor Naveen and Keisha because I, I was like, I, 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 I'm not going to read all the scripts. I can do all the, I can give notes on all the other stuff. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's basically why. And Roshan, um, you know, as a queer South Asian second generation immigrant, like he's, and a very talented director. It's not just because of who he is, like he's incredibly smart and astute and now we'll bring everything to the to the project. So yeah, it's just one of those stories that I, you know, I wrote this play when I was too young to doubt myself or know any better or be like, is this my story to tell? Um, I just kind of wrote it, it, it in full earnestness and, and, and uh, good faith. So um, I'm happy and really happy it's still being produced. Um, and I hope the, yeah, I hope the movie kind of takes it to the next. I, I am so excited about that, and you are doing amazing work segueing right into my next set of questions. Thank you. Um, uh, so you wrote this in 2014 or so, which was also, I think, the year of, um, uh, of your breakout, of a breakout play of yours in Love and Warcraft, which was seen all around. Um, can you, if you would not be able to, and you may say this is not for me to you to judge, um, when you look back on on um, who you are as a writer, who you were as a writer then, you alluded to it. How do you see yourself different as a writer today? Not just, obviously, who you're writing for and the kinds of genre in terms of film, television, streaming, but do you see yourself as a, do you question yourself more? Do you question yourself less? I definitely question myself more. Um, so there is, like in Love and Warcraft, it's just it's one of those plays that I, I wrote completely, fully from myself. It was one of those plays where like I wrote 50 pages in a day, which has never happened ever, ever since. Like it's one thing you can only do when you're in your early 20s. And it was it's this kind of farce about a girl who doesn't want to have sex, um, who falls in love with somebody and he's like, I do want to have sex with you. What are we gonna do about this? And <laughs> Why am I telling the story? I don't know. But it's just like, so like, you know, it got done in so many different places. And then at one college production that I, I happened to be at, that I was the talk bag, there was this like very bright young person who told me that I was erasing a sexual identity. 
And I was like, oh, I did not mean for this to be about asexual identity at all. It's about me and my issues and, and my anxieties. <laughs> um, but it's just one, it's just one of those things where like now when I'm writing, I am very, very cognizant of like what is it, what could be the impact of this story? And you can't, you know, you can't like figure everything out. You can't write something that's not gonna have like a negative impact on anyone. That then you know, that's not nothing's there's nothing there. But I do think it's important as an artist to think about harm reduction. So for instance, like this play, I don't I don't really know if I would write it now, which is why I did not write this screenplay adaptation. But I did write it with complete and full sincerity and like just out of my heart. So um, I'm still trying to write that way. Uh, the only time I can write anything meaningful is when I write that way. So I'm going to kind of shut down my, um, what is it, that brain, and just go full right brain onto the page just every time um, something meaningful happens. I think that, that left brain, right brain divide is very difficult, I think, for any creative artist who is so much happily, so much more aware of the consequences of artistic choices that are being made now, but it does, it can very much paralyze you. Mm -hmm. uh, but you've not been paralyzed until you the past year, you've been really busy. Uh, one thing that helps is you don't, 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 don't be on social media. <laughs> just stay off of it. Just do your work. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I have a Twitter account, I think I've posted three times. Yeah. Um, uh, so, the past year as an artist, uh, Queen was at Long Wharf in Art New York, you revised House of Joy, speaking of Reduction for Rep Theater of St. Louis, the incredible booking way the Alliance, commissioned for the fancy new Perelman Center uh, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, all of this while also being really busy with a Hollywood career, and then there was the two children. So tell me about your past year as an artist. What did you learn about yourself? What did you in the work you're creating? How are you feeling? You were not feeling, according to this interview in 2022. You were feeling a little dispirited, especially about theater. Extremely dispirited about theater. When, when, the, when the pandemic started in 2020 and um, everything shut down, I just found myself so profoundly disillusioned with the greater theater community because suddenly this huge swath of the artistic population was completely out of work, right? Um, playwrights were not really affected because we have never expected to make money from the theater. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I'm just saying that frankly, like playwrights have never, it just doesn't work out economically, that's just not the case. Every playwright has another job. So when the pandemic happened, the playwrights were like, okay, well, I'm going to continue doing my freelance marketing or whatever it is that we do. Um, but actors, directors, uh, stage managers, um, you know, like everybody in design, people who worked gig to gig, traveling the country, suddenly completely out of work. And what did the theaters do? They joined together to lobby Congress to protect their real estate. There was one bill that like theaters really lobbied before, it was called Save Our Stages, and it was just to protect the real estate. It was not, nothing done for the artists. And I was furious, and I was like, what am I doing? And I really felt used by the American theater. I really felt like, okay, American theater gets to do my stuff. They get to pretend that they care about diversity. And it really doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, it's like, Theaters have become a piggy bank for boards to stash their money and then it's tax free. Like that literally that's where I went, right? It's kind of like, yeah. And it's like, yes, there are incredible people still working in these institutions, still deeply care. But wow, is this what what is happening here? At least with Hollywood, like their dishonesty is transparent. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about Hollywood is that I may, I may not own anything I write, but I do belong to a union, and my God, that is incredible to belong to a union. Um, and we lyric lyrics don't have that just for various legitimate reasons. Um, anyway, all of this was happening. Um, I thought we were coming back a little bit, and then Omicron happened, and then I was really depressed. And then the thing that happened in 2022 was I got to work on a children's play at the Atlanta Theater, and I, I knew, even as I was getting really angry with American theater, I was like, if I get a chance to do another children's play, I'm going to do it. And it was at the Alliance Theater, and it was a musical adaptation of this darling picture book called The Incredible Bookie Boy. And when we had kids come in for our first workshop, and they had never seen a play, and they had had all these two years of school, you know, delayed and online learning, 
to see them just like experience a play for the first time, like I'm getting emotional thinking about it, it just made me go like, well, yeah, this is this is it. This is what I want to do. And um, House of Joy went up at St. Louis Rep, and uh, Hannah Sharif, the artistic director, was um, incredibly kind enough. So they wanted to do House of Joy. I had decided I didn't want House of Joy done anymore because I had, as even though it had been produced a few times, I was starting to have this really uneasy feeling that I was writing something that was going to cause harm uh, if it kept getting produced, just certain tropes and themes and characters. So I knew that I wanted to rewrite the whole play before it could <coughs> get produced again. And so that's what I told them. I said, sorry, the play is not available. I have to rewrite it. And they said, well, <laughs> if, you, if we give you till December to rewrite it, do you want to still do it? We'll produce it. So that was just like an incredible offer to to just say sight and see, go ahead and rewrite it. Whatever you want to do, we'll produce it. And that's like, of course I was going to say yes, right? That's one of the most generous things you could ever offer an artist. And so I rewrote House of Joy, and this time I was literally not thinking about, I was not thinking about the audience, I was not thinking about whether people would like it. I wasn't thinking about anything except just the um, just the actors. The only, thing, the only people I actually cared about were the actors, and I just, as I was writing this play, I was like, the only thing that kind of I let come into my head is like, okay, will the actors be safe and secure during do, doing the story? But I didn't give a shit about anybody else. Um, and it was part of that whole disillusionment with the American Theater. So let's write something just for me and just for the artists who will be working on this and, be, and, and just for us, for nobody else. And it was a really thrilling experience, and I'm very happy with the play. And I have not looked at any reviews and I don't want to, no matter, no matter what, like, like if this play gets done again, like this is this pure expression of my soul and it's weird and it's incomplete, but I love it. So yeah, it was a really profoundly impactful artistic year. Um, and thankfully also a good year in, uh, in Hollywood, uh, just in time for my next second kid. <laughs> so, yeah. That's, I mean, that's great. Are you still, and, and I just want to um, uh, lift up what you're saying and, 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 and validate what you're saying about, I think, the American theater, a lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of institutional theaters forgot what it is that made them. And, you know, it's like, there's, uh, uh, there's a somewhat performance artist monologue, it's by the name of Mike Daisy, mm -hmm. who, speaks frequently and has actually written whole one person shows about the corporatization of the American theater institutions and how um, uh, how they end up getting they become in some ways conservative because they work so hard to conserve what they have and forget that their job is to serve the community and serve the artists I, I, I love that I love that piece by Mike Deasy. It was one of the first plays that I saw after I moved to LA from India. And uh, I remember I got like rush seats at Center Theater Group in LA and I was sitting in the very back and it was Mike Deasy monologuing. And uh, there's this incredible monologue about <laughs> um, all these regional theaters flying in actors from New York. And they come and then at opening night there's this big uh table full of cheese and that's what they're making they're painting cheese and then all the actors <laughs> eat the cheese and they say this is totally worth not having children and i just love <laughs> i remember that so vividly it's this absolutely brutal takedown of the of the of the industry of american theater and then at the end it becomes extremely sincere it's like look if you listen to this whole thing and you still want to part you still want to you still want to be here you still want to be a part of this I promise you there's a place for you. This was like before I had written like my first play. This was before I even thought about applying to grad school for playwriting. And I was just like, oh, do you promise? <laughs> and it was just, it was a, it's a great piece. That's so funny that that's so foundational for you in terms of theater career. Yeah, I, I remember it was very impactful on me as well. Um, uh, wow, interesting. So, Given your experience at Rep Theater St. Louis, given your experience with the Alliance, um, are you feeling uh, any more hopeful about American theater, or are you thinking, or are you putting your putting your chips into Hollywood, no. where the dishonesty is clear and present? <laughs> well, I love being part. I love working in Hollywood because of this union and like 
Right now, we're going into negotiations, and it just feels incredibly empowering to be one of the few parts of American society right now that's doing anything about late stage capitalism. Like that's basically what the union is fighting against: is the exploitation of labor. And it's, so it feels very empowering in that way. It feels great to have a day job where I get to be protected and I get to be part of a community and be in solidarity with other workers. So I love that. Um, I I have a lot of hope for American theater. I think we're going to keep going forward. I think we're going to keep figuring this out. I think anything that is not sustainable will not last. It will break down, and something else will happen. But I want to keep doing a place for children. Like that is my that is my heart. I want to keep doing that. Um, so as long as I get to keep doing that, um, I'm going to keep doing it. Um, and theater is the, theater is the thing that makes me happy. Like when I finally got into a rehearsal room um, for. I think it was first House of Joy, the new version, and then repeating for our workshop. And it was just, it just suddenly like, I didn't realize how depressed I had been during COVID until I finally got into a rehearsal room and then my soul just filled up. You know, theater is my, theater is my problematic love. <laughs> I love it so much. I love it so much because I love the people who make theater. I'm never going to put them. I'm never going to put the people who make theater. You know, we're all, so weird, and uh, <laughs> nobody else gets us except each other. And how strange you're being. It's crazy that theater's still happening. How crazy it's still happening. My uncle, I'm staying with my uncle and aunt, and my as as good Indian uncles and aunts, they were asking me, so how do how do you make, how does the economics of theater work? And I started to think. <laughs> and then at the end, I was like, it's crazy that it's still happening. <laughs> um, yes. So I have I have a lot of hope. I because I think I just have hope in people and, and we will figure it out. It was just like a moment where like suddenly the scales were felt the rise a little bit and suddenly see everything. But I think a lot of us felt that way when the pandemic happened and we kind of saw the lies and the hypocrisy in many parts of our society, you know, not just theater. So um, it's it, theater's not unique in how it's functioning within within our you know our system. When you look at an audience uh, for a TYA show, theater for young audiences show that you've written or or you're just observing, how do you think that audience compares to an adult audience? I mean, when you are, uh, I mean, like, I have the answer for myself um, from watching, you know, student matinees and the difference, like, how student met, I remember I worked at Classic Stage Company in New York when I was there for, in the, in the early 90s, uh, mid 90s, and uh, we did this fabulous production of End Game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the adults came and they would see this end game with these fairly famous actors and be like, oh, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. There was that, okay, well, the theories about what it was, all of this. And the kids would be like, oh, that's about nuclear war. <laughs> I get it. Oh, that's like, oh, that's a, a, and like, just nothing in front of their eyes, to, nothing to cloud, no, nothing between them and the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wish I could, I wish I could see plays again like a kid, right? I think, I think we all do. It's um, it's the best. Uh, um, I've been able to do two TYA plays so far. One was for little babies. One was for ages zero to four. And uh, oh my God, that is that was, also the Alliance? I also the Alliance. Uh, their favorite. program. So the Alliance, just if you don't know, in Atlanta, is like the arena stage of Atlanta, mm -hmm. and I mean even bigger. It's more like the theater at Lincoln Center because it's part of the Woodruff Center in, in Atlanta. And, and so they've got the symphony, and they've got the this and the that, this major awesome theater. And I remember when I was, I actually directed a play there before I came to Olney, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of theater for the very young. I think they pioneered it really. It's where like parents bring their toddlers. Yeah. And, and infants, so infants, little crawling mm -hmm. infants, and then you create an immersive spectacle for them. Um, that needs to work for six-month-olds, and it needs to work for five-year-olds. Five-year-olds will shout out the plot hole <laughs> the moment they spot it. So you've got to be really good at writing. Um, and it was just such a joy because I never know what an audience really thinks. You know, I never know. But with with TYE, you know, it's great. The honesty is great. It forces you to like be at the top of your game in terms of an as an artist. You have to work so hard to deliver something that kids will respect. You know, because kids are the purest, purest like they are the purest audience. They don't, they have, they have no idea. They have no idea. They have nothing. They don't know any idea about anything. They just come in and 
whether the, the only thing that matters is whether the story works or not, right? So um, it, it, is, it is the most gratifying thing when it's like GYA fails. And when it doesn't work, it doesn't feel terrible. It's just kind of like they gave me very good feedback with these kids. And now I'm going to figure out how to make it so that they feel really well and they get into it. Yeah, it's great. What um, what's the first show that you hope your two young kids see live? They saw well. My toddler saw the Incredible Book Eating Boy. Oh, good. And uh, he loved the first half. It was so fun. He was literally bouncing in his seat, mm -hmm. and he and after the first big song ended, he shouted, "Book Eating Boy!" It was so amazing. And then uh, there was a scary scene in the middle where the books come out and they pretend to eat the boy. <laughs> Because the boy's been eating them, and uh, my son did not know it. He was very upset, and he left. And, uh, he still talks about the books and the books, the books. But he talks about the books in his tone of voice. But yeah, I know. It, it was pretending. It was pretending they were just actors inside the. Um, but it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. It was. I mean, he's so happy, and um, so yeah. I I hope I hope I get to do more stuff that they get to see. Um, yeah. Cool. So after, to, after tonight, or whenever everybody here sees tonight's Indian Boy, you're going to want to see more work by Madhuri, um, even though it's not necessarily going to feel like a nice Indian Boy, because as we already said, no two plays um, by Madhuri are like. Um, tell us, just go ahead and give yourself a little free press, because goodness knows Netflix and HBO and Hulu, they all need that. Uh, no, seriously. Uh, of the stuff that you're working on um, for Hulu, for I think HBO as well, right? What What are you most excited about? What should we most look forward to? The Nevers? Well, the... again, keep your fingers crossed, but I'm working on an adaptation of a Jumpa Lavi book, and so it would be like the first time a Jumpa Lavi book comes to television. Awesome. Um, Which one? The um, Unaccustomed Earth. It's a collection of short stories. It's a good um, one. Yeah. So um, really hoping that works out. Um, the one for HBO is a really ridiculous crime comedy that's set in Mumbai, and it's just it's just so much fun. So I hope that I hope that happens too. We'll see. Um, I hope Disney decides to make the sister act movie at some point. Whether she's not, writing sister act. Whether or not I'm I'm the final screenwriter on it, I don't know. Um, but I'm a huge fan of movie over in the franchise, and so I hope you know I hope to see that movie out. As a screenwriter, you don't really have much control over what happens. You do your job, you turn in the script, and then you hope for the best. So, but yeah, I mean, out of everything, I really hope a nice Indian boy happens, you know? So, um, yeah. Cool. Okay. We have a few more minutes to see. I don't know, does anybody have any, any questions? Understanding that not everybody here has, that, that, that very few folks here have seen the show so far, but you might have questions. Yes, sir. Do you draw any of your ideas, particularly from? Particular uh, movies that have been Bollywood and like culture, and which ones and how, and what themes draw you in from that, and what the major plays. You know, I haven't seen that many Bollywood movies. I've seen, I saw DPLJ, um, and I'm not, I'm not like the biggest follower of Indian cinema. Um, but the thing that's great about Indian cinema is the absolute earnestness and the complete lack of irony and the lack of distance and a lack of cynicism, you know. Like I think, um, I think even if you if you see something and you're kind of like, well, that's an over commercialized piece of crap just from the trailer. When you actually see the movie, every single frame is absolutely sincere. Like it's just, it goes beyond camp, you know. Sometimes in your cinema, and that I think is a great quality to have in storytelling. And I I hope to bring that. I I don't ever want to write anything cynical or ironic. I want to commit to whatever it is I do. And Indian, Indian um, films really commit, which is great. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Does your son understand that you wrote the books, uh, Book Eating Boy, and does he ask you what happens after the scene? He does not want to know. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to know. He just wants, he just keeps asking me, why did they try to eat him? And I tell him over and over again that context of the story. Um, and then he, he seems to accept it. And then a few months later, he's like, why did we try to eat him? And they know it's about the play. Um, 
Yeah, not yet. He knows that I write stories, but I don't think like he cares. <laughs> In a few years. Yeah, he, kn he knows what a play is now, which is really exciting. So he knows that I'm here at a play. Um, and I really want to take him to more. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that just really looking forward to that and hoping there are more opportunities to take, take my kids to the theater. Yes, Drew? Have you heard the evil eye? Have they heard the evil eye or seen yeah. evil eye? Yeah, the, the, this uh, audio book, uh, audible book that you wrote, did your son listen to that? No, I mean, I don't think you get it. I mean, he's you know he's three, um, but that's definitely something I hope they I hope they check out when they're older. Um, uh, if you want to see something of mine that's actually like on a streaming service right now, you can uh, check out my movie Evil Eye, which is on Amazon Prime. It's also an Audible audio book, so you can listen if that's how you prefer to to take it in. It was originally an audio play, so that's how I wrote it at first, and then. And I got an opportunity to write the screenplay for the film adaptation. Did um, Audible produce it? Yes, Audible, and Audible produced the audio book. And then, but aren't they producing also? They are. They're producing stage plays. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Amazon was one of the producers of the movie. So there was a bit of corporate synergy there. Um, and Blumhouse. Amazon and Blumhouse produced the movie. Um, yeah, it's a bit dark. And I don't think he'd get it. <laughs> and he doesn't have the patience for it. We're, I'm still try we're still trying to get him to like, Listen to like the Hobbit audiobook on a car ride, and even that is, you know. Hobbit's pretty advanced for three. I think I was 42 when I was The thing is, he's very excited about the dragon. So he does like talking about Smog the Dragon, um, and Smog the Dragon keeps popping up in bedtime stories. So we're trying to get him into the actual book. Exactly. Any last questions? So when you watch a play that you have written, do you go in with fear or excitement? That's a great question. Are you when you see when you go to see a play that you've written, do you go in fear, trepidation, excitement? Depends on if it's a new play or not. If it's a new play, I'm incredibly anxious and kind of listening like really intently to the audience because I'm still working on it. So um, it's part of the process. Um, if it's a play like tonight, you know. Just just hoping the actors have a good time and nobody nobody gets hurt. That's all. <laughs> I just don't. I want everybody to be safe and healthy at the end of the show. That's a good show, you know. Um, how many times have you seen? How many productions of A Nice City Boy have you seen? Do you think? There was a world premiere in L.A. There was a production. Yeah, these was players, and then there was a production in the Bay Area that I got to see. And I got to meet the cast of the Chicago production, but I didn't actually get to see the show. Um, yeah, so this would be the third, the third oh, time. Cool. This is the first time um, a non-Asian theater has produced a show. The first? The first time. So fascinating. I mean, the, the theaters that Madri's talking about, Silk Road in Chicago, is an amazing theater and has done a great deal to make sure um, Asian and South Asian plays are part of the canon in Chicago, the same with East Coast. It was Rassica Theater. Oh, it was Rassica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is it, was it Silk Road in San Francisco? No, that is... Silk Road is based in Chicago, but this was Rassica Oh, Theater. Golden, and Golden it, Thread. Golden Thread is based in the Bay Area. And uh, they were in residence, Rassica Theater was in residence at Victory Gardens, and so it was in the Victory Gardens, it was by Thank you, thank you. Um, I find that so I know, it's, so it's crazy. Weird. I, I ranted about it once. Yeah, we're friends now. I ran to <laughs> I was on a panel at the Atlantic Theater about at the Asian Mix Fest. It's a it was a it was a festival of readings of plays by Asian playwrights and And then I was on a panel with a bunch of Asian playwrights. I remember Raji Joseph was sitting next to me on the panel, and then I was just like talking about, and no white theater has done a nice and gay boy. And do you know what kind of audiences they would be? <laughs> Do you know how much fun they would have? And I just like suddenly went off and then I sat there very embarrassed. And then Raji Joseph just like leaned over and like patted my shoulder. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm very surprised that for, that, that hasn't happened. I mean, at, at the first preview, which got a standing ovation, which does not happen in that in the smaller theater. Um, it happens more often in the bigger theater because people feel like they're supposed to in a big theater because it's Broadway. Um, so anyway, that's make you feel good. Um, 
or, or, or make you, make you, then stop shut up. Um, but no, this, this woman came out and she was, she said, I had such a great time. This was so wonderful. Uh, totally. Those were my parents. That was my family. I'm Jewish. Like, no, I had the exact, somebody said that to me when there was a reading of the play at the Old Globe Theater in San Diego. And that was maybe the best audience we've ever had for, it was a reading. It was a production, and somebody came up to me and said that was just like my Jewish family. And it just made me so happy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I think that's the certainly the strength of it to me. I mean, one of the strengths of it to me. Um, great. Well, we are just about out of time. It's not 40 minutes. It's because we're friends. That's so great. Thank you. Oh, my God. Thank you. Especially after all the traffic. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.